नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू द न्यू एपिसोड ऑफ फ्रीडम चौधरी पॉडकास्ट माई सेल्फ दीपा अधिकारी टूडे इन द पॉडकास्ट विल बी फोकस्ड ऑन जर्नलिज्म सराउंडिंग कोविड नाइन्टीन पेंडामिक centered on how covid-19 is changing journalism we are connecting you to the journalist with the health experts and newsroom leaders through a webinar series on covid-19 which is organized by the international center for journalist icfj the series is the part of icfj's global health crisis reporting forum participant in the webinar are new york times national editor mark lashi journalism director for newspapers digital and radio at rvc group in brazil and wall street journal newsroom innovation chief robin kong as panelist in the webinar likewise columbia university to center for digital journalism professor imli bell and marta glass group rvc brazil have participated in the discussion dr julia posetti icfj's director of global research moderated the discussion now let's listen to the discussion hi good morning everyone thanks very much indeed for joining us uh here at the latest in a series of webinars hosted between the icfj and the tau center at columbia journalism school um the theme of our uh series is uh covering COVID and the pandemic. It's linked uh, in particular to a uh, study uh, that the Tau Center and ICFJ are conducting into how COVID is changing journalism. Hopefully this morning, uh, we've talked a lot so far in the series about the pressures and uh, the, 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 the privations um, that journalism is suffering at the moment. Hopefully this morning we can also show you some of the innovations and, if you like, the, the power of journalism through storytelling. Uh, and I'm really, really thrilled to be joined by three of the world's absolutely sort of best editors to talk to about this. Um, uh, they will tell you a little bit more about their organisations and what they're doing. Uh, but just very quickly, we're joined by Mark Lacey, the uh, national editor at the New York Times. Welcome, Mark. I love your, love your press uh, notice on your bookshelf. Uh, Robin Kwong, who is the uh, new Director of Newsroom Innovation at the Wall Street Journal, uh, or at least has started that post in December uh, 2019, who uh, previously was 12 years at the Financial Times, where in a very similar role, he led innovation, particularly around storytelling and story, story formats. Um, and Marta Gleitsch, very welcome, Marta, from Brazil. Uh, Marta is the Journalism Director for uh, Digital and Radio at the RBS Group uh, in Brazil. And of course, my colleague, uh, in my partner in crime and research, uh, Dr. Julie Pizzetti, uh, who is the ICFJ's Global Director of Research. So welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to kick off, if that's okay, uh, with Mark uh, and the New York Times. Um, so uh, the Times has been in the headlines for all sorts of reasons uh, in the past week. Um, one of the good reasons it's been in, 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 in the news recently is for some of the very, I think, powerful work it's been doing on reporting COVID, which after all is the hometown story, Mark, you know, so, so people forget, we think about the New York Times as being a global brand, but it's also, you know, we're, we're in the city, which is the epicentre of the epicentre. And one of the things I think that was uh, most striking was your your addition uh, in Memorial Day weekend, where you ran both uh, through the, the, the paper, a very, very powerful uh, front page of a thousand uh, of the, the people who had died, and uh, one line. Uh, descriptions or obituaries, just just so that we remember those who those people are, and 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 have a translation of that online as well. Just wondered, I know you have some sort of visuals to show us, because I was going to say, say, could you tell us a bit more about how the Times has been sort of approaching this and some of those uh, innovative uh, packages that you've put together? Sure. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, it's really good to be here. This is a story, um, and I'm going to show you a couple um, of slides here. This is a story that's uh, very much, in a sense, a data story, um, an epidemiological story. Um, and the New York Times has been collecting data on cases, um, on deaths, on testing, from the very beginning all over the world. But it's also um, really a human uh, story. Um, it affects everybody all around the world. 
And I think this, this um, project that you're talking about was meant to sort of merge the two of those to um, really acknowledge that the numbers that we're talking about um, have, have grown so large that they're actually hard to fathom. And so we were approaching this 100,000 death uh, anniversary. Um, and it was, uh, there, there was discussion about how can we at the New York Times, um, how can we show what that means and make people uh, really feel that number? Um, and, I, and I think uh, what, what this project was meant to do is sort of humanize, uh, humanize the, the whole thing. And so um, can you see, uh, Emily, the, the, uh, the, the front page, is that showing there? Um, I, it's, not, it's, no, no. it's not at the moment. If you were, yeah, there we go. Oh, there Perfect. We yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so uh, basically, uh, this, this, um, this image was featured in a, uh, a pointer, um, uh, piece about the New York times front page. And we, we ran a front page, uh, and, and you can see it here off to the right. Yeah, th uh, yeah. That was, that was all, um, names and a little bit of bio information. There was not a single picture. There were no other articles. This went on for four pages inside and it was a thousand uh, names, 1% um, of the 100,000 people who had died. The, the outpouring um, from this was just dramatic. And off to the left, you can see the digital display that that was just as powerful. And it's, in some sense, this showed the powers both of digital media and the powers of print media in one organization. And you, we could argue all day over which, which was more powerful. And I think they were equally powerful. But I guess the, the point here was, how do we make people um, feel what a hundred thousand deaths mean, and all of these are, are actual people whose lives ended, um, you know, were too, were shortened by this pandemic, and it was it was a simple process. You know, we we basically called two hundred sixty eight local newspapers all across America to find people who had died of of coronavirus, um, and we we were trying for some representation as to where they were from and who they were. Um, and and we, the, the reaction from this was incredibly strong. This was one of the most read um, New York Times pieces, not just this year, but in history. Um, and so it really like struck people. Um, it was, you know, the, it was shared all over, um, all over the world. There were, you know, news organizations were talking about our front page. When was the last time we did something like that? You know, and, and it re it really, you know, the people, the comments were just flowing in like crazy. And then as you can see here, um, as you can see here, people used our front page mm -hmm. to make all sorts of political statements and uh, cartoons and other things. But, but for us, this was data, which we're, we have a massive data collection effort that's driving all of our journalism, yet um, th we're trying to uh, bring the data to life and not, th there is no reason that uh, stories on something as dramatic as a pandemic F ever have to be dull. And I think that was the purpose behind this. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, Mark, for sharing that with us. And, 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 and just before we move on, I just want to ask, um, how, just, just so people know, I'm sure that they would have guessed this anyway, but the New York Times, your newsroom was one of the first to close down uh, you know, I think sort of certainly sort of you, you closed the New York Times newsroom before many businesses were closed in New York. So all of this has had to be every everybody is working completely remotely. Is that right? Right. So so it really has taken uh, some some getting used to all of the collaborative discussions that you really need to do this sort of thing. 
have to be uh, arranged in, in conversations like this. So I've, I've, I'm talking to people in little boxes and I'm not actually seeing people face to face. We're a huge organization. And in order to do the sort of journalism we're discussing today, you have to work across departments. Um, you know, and so we had to, for this project, work together with graphics, with uh, we have digital design with our print hub with so many different departments and there were just so many meetings and it's just a lot tougher to do, but it's just required to do this. Um, so, Can I ask Mark, sorry, before, before we move on, another question. How does um, that sort of need to communicate virtually over a project that has such a creative outcome, how, does, how do you think that has uh, affected the way you might communicate into the future? In other words, have you learned things through this process of digital collaboration, trying to, trying to bring meaning to those conversations that you'll take forward into, you know, IRL life when ho hopefully this is over? Yeah, I think, I think uh, we're talking about that now. The New York Times uh, building is still closed. I am uh, talking to you from a guest bedroom that may appear to be a polished office, but it is just a guest bedroom. Um, they're, they're really, we're talking now about um, how the New York Times will be different when we do go back. The Times will be closed through Labor Day, but we don't expect um, the entire, all of next year to be returning to the same way we were working before. And I think, I think there's just something about um, uh, no matter whether you're in the office or whether you're home or whether you're doing other things, like the, the ability now to convene people. And part of it is just, who do we need in this meeting? And I think we should be asking that a whole lot more, like over inviting, you know, in, and, and so, so what brains can we bring together to brainstorm? We're just doing a whole lot more. And I think this, this, um, this uh, situation we all find ourselves in, you know, I'm sitting alone here and the only way I can get anything done is by inviting people into a discussion. Um, it's no longer by turning to the person next to me, turning to the regular people, it's, it's by convening. And I think great journalism comes from convening a lot of smart people and and you know, and, and so I think we're we're we may emerge from this um, better at that because it has to be so intentional in a situation mm -hmm. like this. Fascinating, Marta. Can we can we come to you? You're in Brazil, and um, the New York Times, in fact, uh, published a story earlier this week describing Brazil as being in coronavirus freefall, um, which has huge implications, of course not just for the population, but for your news organization with its many outputs from radio and, and I think television, but through to newspapers, you're responsible for the papers and the radio uh, output um, from, from your news organization. So let's take it from the perspective of the humanity that we've heard described and we've seen uh, visualized for us by the New York Times. I mean, radio is, for example, a very human uh, medium. Um, a lot of people will uh, speak and share um, highly emotional experiences via radio. But when you're in the middle of a pandemic where social distancing has, has an impact, um, how are you trying to respond creatively to that challenge, for example? And don't, don't need to limit your response to radio, but um, you can reflect broadly. Thank you, Julie. Hi, everyone. Our main option in RBS, the company where I work, is uh, during this pandemic is constructive journalism, also called uh, uh, solution journalism. Uh, before the pandemic, we were talking inside the company what we can do to face uh, losses of credibility and uh, relevance. And we decided to adopt constructive journalism in our practices. Uh, you know the kind of the, the, the criticism we have in the press, uh, that uh, we ha have a negative bias or shows only one side when approaching the news, uh, of, or even that we are disconnected from real life. 
when the pandemic arrived, uh, all this talk about constructive journalism has been accelerated a lot because we want to bring some hope to discuss a lot how we can solve uh, health or economic problems uh, related to this crisis. So what do we do? Uh, we quickly trained 100% of our newsrooms in television, radio station, newspapers, digital. And now solution journalism is becoming uh, like a part of our culture. Uh, I'd like to, to mention an email from the public uh, I received some minutes ago. Uh, a lawyer wrote uh, this, and I'm going to, to, to read, uh, translating. Thank you. I want to congratulate you and the entire team of journalists for the twist that was given in order to accentuate the good news that is most frequently being broadcast, analyzed, and commented. It motivates us, lift the mood, transmit us, and inject a feeling better, less pressure, more light, and fundamentally generates a feeling of confidence in our work and in our life. So uh, constructive journalism uh, is, uh, has been very important, a very important practice when uh, reporting on coronavirus. So just to summarize, I mean, solution, solutions journalism, which has been uh, rebranded to an extent as constructive journalism, really focuses on analyzing um, potential solutions to a problem, like putting the emphasis on possibilities rather than um, concentrating only on the very serious, uh, deadly consequences of a pandemic, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But how do you approach that in a country like Brazil when, not unlike some other countries, the leader, the president, mm -hmm. is an active <laughs> uh, spreader of disinformation? So you have this double challenge of needing to ensure that your audience has accurate and fair information and that you're countering lies, let me, let me put the words out there, uh, given the situation <laughs> you find yourself in, and disinformation and misinformation. But then yes. to be, so how do you, do you do both that work of being accountable to your audience uh, in terms of investigative journalism and accountability journalism, and do the work that you describe of emphasizing uh, potential solutions? What does that look like and sound like? Yeah. Uh, in Brazil, uh, we are fighting uh, several wars at the same time. It's the fight against the coronavirus, uh, a very, very strong radicalization. Uh, we are receiving much more attacks on the press and also a great confusion uh, on the part of the government and the president which uh, launched erratic strategies and messages in relation to social isolation, for example. Uh, the government uh, changed the Minister of Health twice during this pandemic. And now the government even uh, omits information about uh, numbers of the disease. You know that the media launched this week an initiative to supply the numbers that the government does not provide. So a, a partnership between some of the country's uh, uh, leading newspapers and websites collects data, such as number of infected and number of deaths, and disseminates it daily. It's a, it's a huge challenge to do journalism in Brazil today. And uh, the newsroom uh, needs to, to deal with this coverage, uh, all this coverage, political and uh, at the same time. Uh, 
we deal with this, uh, Julie, by uh, specializing reporters in numbers, in health, on specific topics uh, related to this disease. And uh, how do we do, the, do we do this? To train the journalists, we use this, uh, this kind of vir virtual meetings. Uh, so uh, twice a week, we have short conferences, and this includes uh, many issues, but also training to avoid this misinformation. Uh, I think, and that's what I'm trying to do, that we will leave the pandemic more qualified as a team and as journalists when uh, then we're entering this pandemic. So uh, this is what we are trying to do. That's, that's great, Marta. Um, I'm going to come back to you, I think, on some of, some of those, what we should be doing or what we, what, how we're going to kind of leave the pandemic in a way and, and what we all think about the sort of shape of music. So I just want to come to Robin. Hi, Robin. It's great to see you. I'm first Hi. of all going to ask, where are you? I'm still in London. Um, so one of the challenges and some of the new ways of working that we've had to uh, deal with uh, in the course of the coronavirus pandemic uh, is I am uh, re managing my team fully remote uh, five hours ahead of where they are. Uh, and um, that has actually uh, been really good practice for me from December to about February because from March, everybody else is in the same boat as me uh, and having to work remotely. So, um, so, 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 as I said, you, you've actually been in post uh, as, uh, as, as head of um, newsroom innovation there at the, the journal since um, December, but you had a long uh, track record at the, at, the, at the Financial Times over a, a more than a decade of really experimenting, um, probably almost more than anybody else in, 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 in international newsrooms with different types of uh, formats and how uh, you could demonstrate things through games or theatrical performance. I know we've spoken about this, uh, the, these things in the past. Uh, just going back to sort of Mark, Mark, Mark's point about, you know, this is a data story. I think that's how a lot of journalists have reacted to it. The Wall Street Journal, you know, is a, is a business brand, but it has a huge global audience. W what have been the things that you've been thinking about in terms of how do we tell this story differently? And, you know, what are the, what are the challenges that you're in encountering apart from having to get up extremely early to speak to your staff? Yep. Um Yep, absolutely. Uh, I absolutely agree with Mark. I think this is a, this is a huge data story. Uh, and actually, uh, my former uh, employer at EFT um, has done a, a really great job during this time of assembling international data and, and presenting that as well. Um, so my role at the Wall Street Journal um, is to lead a newsroom innovation team uh, of developers and designers. And we basically build prototypes of new features, new formats, new tools. Uh, so in some sense, we're sort of, we work really closely with our data and graphics team, but we're uh, a sort of one step removed from from uh, figuring out directly how to use data and data visualization to tell the coronavirus story. Um, and what our team has been working on is actually uh, along three areas. And I'm just gonna show, share my screen and show a couple of examples. Um, and it's really around how we use technology, uh, how we use sort of um, the, the various products of the Wall Street Journal, the website, the app, um, to uh, first of all, sort of make uh, information, make reported facts, make crucial information more accessible um, and more sort of widely disseminated. Um, this page itself has a couple of examples of things we've worked on. So um, very early on in March, when we made the decision to turn some of our stories free to read as free resources, uh, there was the question of, well, the journal does this so rarely, how are people gonna know and how are people gonna find what are the free resources? So our team helped very quickly build this um, pretty simple navigation bar at the top um, that we then work with our publishing desk to keep updated and populated and work for product teams to make continuous improvements to it. Um, so, you know, it now loads much faster. The design is much cleaner from the first version that we popped up. Um, but we were sort of the team that was able to uh, just go in very quickly, put a first version up uh, and just be very nimble and inject some uh, momentum into it. Um, this is a, a Q&A piece, uh, one of the examples of sort of uh, story formats that have been in existence for some time and have been used, but have really sort of come to the fore uh, during the coronavirus pandemic. People have a lot of questions about all aspects of uh, what is happening, about testing, about, you know, our states opening up, what uh, stores were closing down and what's, what's opening up again, um, and uh, sort of 
fairly simply. You have a bunch of questions and you answer them uh, with reporting. Uh, but what we did was to create this new interactive format because we thought that um, if you're a reader and you come to one of these articles, what you want to know is, is the question that I have in my head going to be answered in this article? And in the traditional format where it's just static and everything is, is opened up, it's quite hard to skim through and find uh, your question. Um, so uh, it's a sort of minor sort of format change, but we think it's one that just sort of like gets people to information a bit quicker, helps them sort of navigate our site and, and look at what is actually out there. Um, and then uh, further on, um, a second aspect of what we're really doing is to try to use this as an opportunity to turn uh, journalism into a bit more of a two-way conversation, um, to make it less about sort of us doing reporting, finding things out and broadcasting it back out to everybody, but to really sort of engage uh, sort of a hackney term with the audience uh, and try to figure out what they need and what they want us to find out for them and to do that. Um, so uh, the infrastructure behind the ability to spin up a feedback form, a call out form like this, uh, and to handle all of the responses that come in, uh, and then to share that uh, in a safe and secure and, and privacy sort of protected way within the newsroom for reporters who can then use it to go to reporting. Um, that is some of the, the sort of invisible work that, that our team works on as well. And I think one of the things that I've been really heartened by is just the sheer amount of reader call outs and sort of uh, sheer sort of work the reporters and editors have put in to reach out to readers um, in the past couple of months. Um, this is uh, sort of in collaboration with our video team, but we also created these live Q&A events um, to uh, sort of uh, bring conversations and interviews to life so that uh, not only is there a reporter on a virtual stage, in this case, usually uh, over a Zoom call, uh, interviewing someone, but uh, subscribers and readers can ask questions um, and have the questions sort of asked and answered during that event. Um, and then the last thing I want to point out is um, some of the work that I've been especially excited by and that work that we've been doing is around thinking about like whose voices get heard during this pandemic and whose stories get told and whose perspectives sort of get seen. Um, I mean, particularly within uh, mainstream media like the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and this is a project that we worked really closely with our young audiences team. Uh, and it's to sort of uh, they did hundreds of interviews. They did a fantastic job doing hundreds of interviews with young people all over the country about their experiences during this uh, pandemic. Um, and uh, I think uh, we want to talk a little bit about reporting challenges later on. But one of the reporting challenges is it's hard to get out there and talk to people. And um, sometimes, especially younger people, they're like, well, why don't I just like shoot something on my iPhone and send it over to you? Uh, this is going to sound a little bit inside, sort of technical insider baseball -y, but um, most news organizations' video content management systems just aren't really set up to handle like user submitted little video. Oh, we Robin, you lost you for a moment, Robin. Robin, we've lost you for a moment. I'm going to hope that you come back. Uh, this is this is what this is London Wi-Fi, everybody. <laughs> um, but that's a that's a, a I'll, I'll wait for Robin. Oh, you re-established your connection, Robin. We lost your Am screen. Am I back? You're back. You're you back. Are. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, you were just. Sorry about that. You were just. I think. I think the content content management system gods got to you there because you were just. Yes. <laughs> never bad mouth. Yes. Never, never bad, bad mouth. mouth. Your CMS. <laughs> never mad, bad mouth. CMS. Um, but you were making a point, which I was. I was. You know, very familiar with this um, from my days of uh, running the Guardian's digital um, outfit, which is, as you were saying, the CMS actually of most publishing sites doesn't work in the same way that social platforms do. So you can't just, it's not interoperable with the yep. kinds of storytelling sort of techniques and tools. So what, yep. did, you, what did you do about um, that? So, yeah, I was just sort of saying that, like, it, it sounds quite simplistic on the surface, but just sort of figuring out a way that we could handle, I think on that page that I showed, we had around 60 videos. So you could handle like a largest amount, largish amount of videos all coming in in terms of different orientations, different formats, getting it through the system and just getting it published. Um, should be a simple thing, but actually isn't. Um, and But I'm really glad that we were able to do that work because it means that we could then go out to, when we go out and interview and talk to all of these young people say, hey, you want to just sort of tell us something on video, you want to talk into the video and tell us something about your experience, you can do that, send it to us and we'll actually be able to do something with it. Can I ask you, Robin, uh, just because um, Mark was saying that, you know, the, 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 the uh, memorial um, exercise uh, per, for, for, from the New York Times, not surprisingly generated 
uh, the biggest sort of engagement and traffic that the, that the uh, news organisations ever seen. Um, and I know that you know your former colleagues at the Financial Times, those uh, those uh, charts that right. John Bernard Murdoch has been doing, you know, who would know that a chart would be the most popular thing that you would ever publish? But there you are. What what have been the things that um, that that you've seen most engagement with at the journal? Is that is it is it the daily updates? Is it different? You know, kind of what do people come to you looking for? Um, I think. Uh... It's probably the case for sort of quite a lot of our publications in that um, the traffic surge is quite across the board, actually, that there has just been an across the board sort of surge in interest in viewership and, and page views for our stories. But I think for the journal specifically, people are interested in what's going to happen to the economy. And so sort of when right. we do stories about which states are opening up and to what extent and when and where and how, um, that's been really popular. Another is um, a series of columns we did called Making It Work, uh, where we just talk to people in different professions about, you know, what is it like being a truck driver during the pandemic, mm -hmm. running a bakery in the pandemic, uh, trying to manage a factory floor during the pandemic. I think those stories about how people engage with their work, how people go about their work, um, what they're sort of, uh, yeah. Uh, and then um, uh, related to that, the small business loans, sort of just explaining what that is, who's eligible, can you apply for it? I think some of those have been some of our, our really sort of uh, uh, engaging and popular stories. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's a question I was going to ask you, but I'm actually going to ask the 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 whole panel, and I'll I'll start with you. Um, just looking at your navigation bar, there one of the things which um, actually I was talking to my students about this, which is uh, how do you you know, we don't often talk much in newsrooms about how information, how important information design is. And suddenly in the pandemic, uh, you have a daily story which deeply affects people personally, which actually they have to change their behavior in accordance to uh, what's going on outside their homes. Um, and as a news organization, the, the sort of the idea of refreshing things constantly, et cetera, you know, kind of, I'm just wondering how your organizations thought about or maybe did sort of, did, did you approach, you know, information design differently? Did you sort of think about, you know, what are the things that actually we just wouldn't do at the moment, but which might work, uh, you know, which, which will work for this situation? Um, yeah, uh, I think that is really one of the big central challenges. And I think um, some of the things that we have done so far and that I showed just now go a little bit of a way towards addressing that. So just having, you know, um, I think that what do we know about testing story was, I don't remember the exact date, but probably first published two months ago um, and then sort of kept updated since and just like making sure it has that spot quite prominently on the homepage. Um, some of those things do help. Um, I quite liked um, seeing some of the examples uh, come out from different news organizations in the last couple of days of an article that just says, you know, what do we actually know? Um, uh, so it's been, uh, if we count from the start of lockdown, you know, three plus months, um, we have actually learned a bunch of things. There are still some questions that we don't know. And just sort of rounding that up and publishing that is, is I thought, a really good idea. Um, but it still sort of exists within the rubric of being an article. And I think sort of we all know that sort of the article sort of uh, half-life is, you know, you get the vast bulk of your traffic within the first 48 hours of publishing and the real challenge is sort of like how to extend that and sort of keep that up afterwards. Um, don't really have sort of really, really great answers to it in part because I think some of the assumptions around what we publish and how it's meant to be consumed is just really baked into the whole infrastructure of the site, the whole information design. Um, so unfortunately, slightly sort of unsatisfactory answer, I'm afraid. No, no, well, it's an honest <laughs> answer, which is very, which is very, very satisfactory. Um, Mark, as well, I sort of come to you next on this, which is, well, you, that's a great point that, 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 that Robin makes about the half-life of articles and also about people needing to perhaps refresh what they think they know about the current situation and and as a news editor or as a you know kind of it is it's almost sort of counter cultural to <laughs> think we have to keep going back a little bit and re-explaining right it's a it's a great question i mean we've been uh talking about forever viewing the news uh, more from the reader's perspective um, and less from a group of smart editors in a conference room uh, deciding what readers should know. And I think this story 
um, the New York Times and I think all of the publications that I read have really embraced this idea much more. Um, so, so we did something early on, which uh, seemed wasn't my idea and probably wouldn't have been my idea, which was, uh, wait, there's a whole lot of, um, of numbers here and people are gonna want to know these numbers and the federal government isn't collecting, much like in Brazil, the federal, the CDC does not have particularly good numbers. Um, maybe the New York Times should step in. So we started collecting numbers um, and we now have close to 40 people doing nothing but collecting numbers. Um, and so the, we believe the very best spot to go to find out if you're living in a particular county in Iowa or Nevada or California or New York, and you want to know what's happening in your home county, you want to know what's happening in your state, you want to know the trends, you want to know the big picture, the smaller picture, that, that the New York Times is a good place to go. And our case, we call it our case counter, um, and it's full of maps and interpretation, is the single most uh, viewed thing that we've produced uh, during all of this. Um, it's updated round the clock. Um, and again, a team of people that I initially wondered, wait, wait, you know, a lot of them are from my desk. Should they be doing this? It has led to so many great other pieces of journalism, including that 100,000 project. Um, it, it's giving, we're seeing trends ahead of time. And we've started something else. Uh, you know, explainers are definitely part, just second nature for us. What questions are people asking that we should provide answers to? But we're doing something else uh, that I think, this is a traditional article, but it's from a reader perspective, we're calling it, um, in, in, in political coverage, it is very common for the, the political reporter to do a state of the race story. It's like, so you've been reading all this disparate information, all these polls, there's all this stuff going on. Give me a, what's the state of what's going on? Um, and Dean Bakay, our executive editor, it was at one of these times where you're sort of hearing, wait, cases are going up here, cases are going down here, they're stable there, there's reopening. Like, what, how should I wrap my mind around what's going on? And he said, give it to, to me, um, can you guys produce a state of the virus story? And so we've now done four of them. We're, we have another one coming out, and it's really like, at this moment in time, what should you know to have an accurate view of what's going on? Because what's really, um, what's really both, uh, it's, it's just a reality in, in science epidemiology is that, uh, of course, there are a lot of truths, but there are exceptions to everything. Um, and so we can say that um, social distancing is an effective way of reducing transmission. We can say that reopening is likely to increase the number of cases. And we can also look at the evidence and find states that reopened where the number of cases are going down. We can find other cases, states where they reopened and the cases are going up where they're stable. There's all this jumble of information and how do we process that for the reader? And so that point that I just mentioned, we're going to be explaining in the next day or so, I won't give away the mystery, but it's really um, trying to cut through all these numbers and help people in a conversation. So is it better or worse? What should I think? Should I be terrified? Should I be optimistic? Um, and, and so that's another thing we're doing, but it really is what's, what's exciting. This is a awful, awful moment in our, in a world history. I mean, think about what we're enduring right now, but for journalism, 
there is, there is an exciting aspect of it. We've been talking about uh, being more innovative. We've been talking about sort of the importance of different story forms and digital, everybody should be digital. Um, and here's a story where all of those trainings that all of these people have gone through for years now, um, it feels as though we've been doing it for this story. Like here's the story where you can use everything you've been taught in every training. And it's really a great test for uh, were those, did those trainings make sense? And I, I think clearly they did. Clearly there, there's something there that breaking out of the traditional long article form um, is, 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 you know, wise, necessary, prudent, just good journalism. And here we have just evidence of it uh, every day. It's a, such an interesting observation that because it, it, it's reminded me, um, you know, my time in the newsroom, the only story that came close to this was really 9-11. And for us at The Guardian, it totally transformed everything that we did from that. You know, if I had to put a pin in a moment, it was it was that day because it's when you discover all sorts of things about your audience, which you've theorized but which you haven't actually had to design into your journalism. And it's a sort of, it, it's, it, it feels like this story, as you say, is exactly the same. And so, Marta, on, on, on that point, um, you were talking about solutions journalism and the, po and the positivity. Um, do, are there things uh, that, so, so, so how, how are the sort of, how are you communicating that with formats are there things now that you're doing differently or do you do things on a daily basis that you you perhaps wouldn't have thought about doing before yeah well uh every week we uh, meet with the editors to evaluate this uh practice of uh constructive uh, journalism and uh, uh we are I, I agree with Mark that uh, we, we have to be very close to our, our audiences. And uh, uh, for example, I'm going to, to give you uh, two examples. Uh, people want to know many, many things about this huge, uh, 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 with this uh, uh, information that comes every day. And it's a challenge to process this every day. So one thing that we, we did is uh, special editions for the newspaper, but for the website in, in PDF uh, on uh, spe specific topics uh, uh, for subscribers only. Uh, they are like uh, guides to access when you need, when the audience need uh, some examples, uh, how, elderly people should uh, protect themselves during this pandemic or how to be well uh, with children at home. That's a big, big problem uh, uh, for our public to, to every, everyone. Uh, how to help people who are in need of food, for example, uh, to be uh, solidarity or how to control the budget to face this crisis. This is a problem to, to all of uh, our public uh, and so on. So uh, this contents had uh, an excellent acceptance uh, by the subscribers. And uh, it, it was a, a way for the newspapers to, to be together, to show solidarity for uh, uh, our audience uh, in this uh, difficult time. Uh, so, uh, we try to organize our uh, coverage uh, in three pillars. One, number one is information, the news of the day. What do you have to know that, that it, it's happening today? Uh, the second one is service. Uh, for example, for people to protect themselves, for example, and uh, uh, this, this kind of things. And third one, very important, is inspiration. Uh, giving hope to people and showing uh, ways to, to go out from this crisis. 
So we, we take care of this balance every, in every edition of the newspaper. Uh, for example, in the front page of the, the website or in a TV program, uh, based on these three pillars, information, service, and inspiration. So I think that we, we, we are very close to our public uh, doing this. And uh, uh, on our uh, news radio station, we, we created a second cha uh, channel just by streaming to answer questions from the audience. Uh, uh, and we use WhatsApp to engage the public in our coverage so, it, so they can uh, uh, send uh, questions and, and we answer in this second channel. Uh, and uh, we, we put some forms like Robin uh, show uh, at the end of the stories uh, in the newspaper and in the, the website to receive contributions from, from users. So that's what w we are doing. That's really great, Marta. Um, I just wanted to, to dig a bit deeper into um, some of the challenges that you are likely to be facing that might um, actually provide insights for those of us in uh, more developed Western contexts in terms of dealing with the human uh, toll and consequences of this crisis. Because uh, even though this is a very big data story and we've heard some excellent examples of how important it is to, to allow the data um, to help drive responses um, and the humanity that can be brought alive with data, as uh, the New York Times example in particular shows, and the little vignettes that, um, that uh, Robin talked about of everyday life. But you're in a, an environment where, um, you know, as is, is the case in many other cities, of course, there is extreme poverty and, and pockets of, um, you know, serious uh, disadvantage that you also have to focus on in terms of how you're serving your audience. In other words, arguably, your audience is more diverse than the elite audiences that perhaps the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal serves. So what can you share with us about how you try to tell the stories of those people who are not, um, you know, even able to uh, afford necessarily a meal uh, in the context of uh, this pandemic. Just talk to us about the way you approach those stories and um, and to try and build that audience. Okay, so uh, we have different uh, media, television that is very popular, uh, a newspaper that that is very popular, and uh, quality newspaper and uh, the radio station. So we reach all the public. And we have to separate and to be very specific in each media. So, for example, uh, in our popular uh, newspaper, we make a front page uh, to, to people to learn how to use a mask, for example. The whole front page. Because we think at this moment, this is our best thing to do to help people. To survive, it's not a question of oh no, doing journalism. No, to survive is a is a very important question. I I, I like to say to to uh, our team that you cannot imagine that in a simple sentence you could be saving one life, and that's what we have to think every day. How can we, as, a, as journalists, can save lives in this pandemic. Because in, in our country here, with lots of confusions with the government and everything, and politics, that's what we have to, to, to do. Service, uh, te uh, teach people how to, 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 do, to survive in this, in this pandemic. So uh, we are trying to reach a different audience, each media has to, to uh, uh, tell the stories in, in different languages, but uh, uh, the main thing is helping people to survive and go on. It's just, fascinating, uh, isn't it, the way that, you know, we have to concentrate on developing creative solutions and this is a time to put all of those lessons into place with all of the incredible technology we have. But 
really sometimes being innovative does come back down to fundamentals of mission and service and saving a life through your journalism. Sorry, just, I, 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 no, I was just going to say that actually sort of just squaring the circle there and, and coming to uh, some of the people that we have in the Q&A. Mm. Um, and thanks for joining us. We have people from everywhere. We have from people from Cameroon, Nigeria, Europe, etc. Um, and I'm just going to wrap up a, a few of the questions that have come in that I think directly re re relate to this, which is um, several people have asked about, you know, what are the best strategies both for um, persuading audiences, as you were saying, Marta, to do the right thing at the right time. Um, and secondly, about this ever-present issue of, of, of trust and, and how we can be trusted providers of news when you often have governments or even official health organizations who perhaps are saying things where you know the facts change or where they have where they're politically compromised um it's it's less of a story format question but i think it comes to this point that you were making Marta, about uh you know describing how to wear a mask you know just giving people good good information um i just want what wondered from each of you maybe kind of you know d d d sort of robin obviously so sort of starting with you again you know often we've talked about the success of news organizations and measured in you know financial st sustainability etc um is there a is there a kind of a, a an eye to how do we how can we make sure that uh, our information is 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 the right information delivered at the right time, and, and do you see that having an impact on how audiences perceive news? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think it has a has a huge impact, and I think one of the challenges for a lot of legacy uh, media organizations, news organizations, is when you are trying to reach out to new audiences, they don't come with that automatic sort of institutional knowledge of, you know, why things are in a certain place or, you know, a whole sort of brand history of why this is trusted. Um, so I think that that is, is critically important. And I think there are two aspects that uh, do make a difference. Um, so one of them, uh, which I really believe in, is just to be in dialogue. Uh, 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 and instead of just trying to broadcast to sort of be, may turn it into a two-way conversation as much as possible. Um, and and part of my team's role is providing the right tools and channels and platforms to allow reporters and editors to do that. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is um, even when we do things that are that seem less traditionally news driven uh, journal, uh, journalism, news driven journalism, um, the more service oriented journalism that we do, just the rigor of reporting really actually matters. So um, I'm going to go back to that slightly sort of simplistic example of our Q&A uh, answers, right? So um, there's a difference between uh, answering a question just by saying, well, you know, I've read, I've Googled it on, <laughs> I've Googled free articles on the web and I've summarized it into this answer for you versus picking up the phone and calling actual doctors and experts and researchers and putting the rigor into that sort of, putting the reporting rigor into that form of journalistic output as well. Uh, I think those two things are just really uh, fundamental and important. Yes, yeah, so, so, so same thing to Mark, really, which is, you know, again, um, that the Times is, I think, very close to its audience, both for good and, and bad. I suspect in the newsroom that you really feel the heat uh, when people disagree with, with what you're doing. Um, but you have, a, you know, there's a, there's a big and very diverse audience within New York City, many of whom are not necessarily Times readers, etc., all of whom are very, very vulnerable to um, the, this disease. Uh, so again, just in terms of sort of, you know, that kind of the, the idea of trust um, and, and, and reaching perhaps some of those communities that how does the Times see its, its role in that? Yeah, it's a great question, uh, Emily. I mean, here, here's one thing. Um, you have to uh, start with the, um, with the science and the data and understand the uh, pandemic. And I think that's where we're starting. We have to become experts in what's going on. So when we discovered that there were racial disparities in who is getting coronavirus, uh, dramatic racial disparities, and who is dying from, racial, uh, from, from uh, coronavirus, you know, we, we had led the paper with this, we disclosed this, this changed the conversation. Um, and, and I think uh, the coronavirus, the health implications of the coronavirus 
cannot be separated from the economic despair that the U.S. is in and the world is in right now. And so you have people who are um, with more people than ever who are without jobs, who are sick or at risk of being sick. You have um, inequality in our healthcare system. All of that is, is like a huge, huge story that requires an organization, and this is sort of what we view as our mission, and I loved Marta's uh, sort of saving lives mission. That was powerful. Um, you know, I, I believe our mission is to cut through all of the misinformation that is out there, and it is out there in Brazil, I'm sure, but it is in the United States, and it's in every country around the world. Um, politicians do not necessarily have an interest in people knowing the inconvenient truths of the pandemic. And they want to project a message of we're, we're on top of this. We're, our strategy is the right strategy. We have this under control. And, and our mission is to really root out the truth. And so, you know, President Trump has offered suggestions on what sort of treatments might be uh, effective mm. in, in dealing with the coronavirus. I mean- Lights, bleach, all, for sort, all manner of, of products. And our job really in a case like that is what is the truth here? And if, mm. we, don't, um, if we don't have credibility and we aren't reporting the truth it's, it's dangerous. It's dangerous in so many different ways. And so, so it is, I agree with, I agree with both the other panelists. I mean, this is, this is life or death. Um, the news media, uh, the public at large has a, has a low, ha, has, has low faith and belief in the news media. All sorts of surveys have shown. Um, and this is a pretty good story for us to be recovering um, some of that uh, at, by, by just being straight, just sticking to what is truthful here and being a great source of, this, of, of cutting through all the misinformation. There is a question, question oh, about oh, that. Sorry, can, sorry, Julie, can I just, I just want to pick up on, on that though, Mark, and just ask everybody because you're both, so we have, uh, uh, outlets that are serving audiences in, you know, epicent real epicenters, you know, the, 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 uh, one of the things that Cuomo, um, that, 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 that Governor Andrew Cuomo said, and I think, I'll, you know, Marta, Marta, I think this, this applies in Brazil. He said uh, about a month ago, where were the bugles? Um, where were the people who should have been calling out the danger of this disease earlier? And he actually named the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and others. Now, Marta, you're in a slightly different position because Bolsonaro was not saying, you know, where the, but, but, but this, is a, this is a question really to reflect on how, you know, we're often told don't overplay things, don't sensationalize them. Um, but just reflecting on that beginning of the, the, the virus, uh, do you, you know, and, and, you know, Cuomo obviously trying to shift blame, but at the same time, you know, do, do you think that perhaps uh, we were too conservative as, as press in terms of not being more sensational, not sort of actually kind of pressing harder at the beginning of the pandemic? Marta, I, I, I wondered how you would cope with that in Brazil, where I'm sure your journalists saw this coming and you had official outlets saying, don't worry, I'm out, you know, in the street shaking people's hands. I think uh, everybody could not predict the, the, the uh, size of this pandemic. And uh, we all as press, as government, as uh, any institution uh, make uh, mistakes uh, uh, in the beginning. Uh, so I think that uh, as local press, we, we, because we are local here in the south of Brazil, uh, we try to see the world and show what's happening outside. But 
in the beginning, I think that local local uh, uh, media could be more closed to this big uh, uh, virus. Uh, so uh, I think everybody made mistakes in this uh, uh, in the beginning. Uh, but I think that we react and uh, very, very quickly. And uh, I think uh, uh, we, as journalists, are the main, the main uh, uh, institution to mobilize the society and quickly uh, say and realize that this is a huge, huge problem and you have to pay attention. So at the same time that we didn't react properly in the beginning, we quickly res make a, a, a response and an answer the, to, to this big question, how is the size of this, this problem and what do you have to do and uh, what is happening and what the science uh, uh, say and everything. So uh, that's my uh, evaluation. And I think that again, uh, to, to, to respond to this is doing be better journalism, uh, uh, to diversify the source sources uh, much more, uh, to ensure that opinion are based on facts and mm. uh, to separate politics from uh, health issues and uh, intensify science and technical uh, approaches in, in, uh, in media and to listen to what the, the public is saying, uh, what the public uh, wants to know. Uh, and in, discuss a lot about uh, these issues inside the newsrooms because the reality is changing in a very, very fast way and we have to follow this and respond to, to our public. Can I follow up on that, Marta? There's, there's a few questions um, coming through from, from the people who are participating today. Um, I realise we're not talking here about the Black Lives Matter movement, but people asking about the conflation of these stories in a way um, the fact that we have now to report on coronavirus in the context of mass demonstrations and how we try and uh, navigate that. Because as Mark and others have pointed out, you know, one of the big uh, stories to emerge from this crisis is the disproportionate way it impacts on uh, people of colour and people from other disadvantaged um, communities. And that goes to issues about ethics that I'd like to try and, uh, in the, the time we have available, touch on ethics and trust, which we've already referred to. Um, and Mark, it would be remiss of me not to come back to you on that point earlier about uh, the need to, you know, robustly represent uh, the facts um, when it comes to building trust with our audience. Um, and this is um, all happening in the context of a great reckoning within journalism internationally around false balance and, um, you know, and challenges around the perceived inability of traditional Western models of journalism to understand the distinction between impartiality um, on the on the one hand and um, you know humane journalism on the other that they don't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive, and this long preamble is to say that there was a controversy, of course, with uh, involving the New York Times where there was a, it appeared an application of a false balance test to one of uh, Donald Trump's claims about um, treating uh, coronavirus. And in the end, if I'm recalling correctly, there was a decision made to at least um, apologize for a tweet and to reframe a story in, in regard to that as a way of trying to deal with um, the audience craving for uh, the role of journalism as a sort of, you know, as, as, a, as a, it's judicious in a way, you know, we assess information and so on. So, can you um, reflect on that just in terms of the, the ethics that are really um, tumultuous uh, at the moment as, as we grapple with these converging issues? The, there, there's, a, there's a lot there and it, I, I can probably talk all afternoon on all of these <laughs> topics. I mean, we're, we're, um, you're, you're very right that the pandemic 
the unrest on the streets that George Floyd story and George Floyd's name is now known by every single journalist um, in, uh, in this uh, chat and all around the world. And there's movements all over the world. They're, they're now one and the same. And, and there are people who are on the streets advocating for uh, police reform who are invoking the disproportionate impact of the coronavirus on black people as one of the things that is getting them out on the street. So it's like one big complicated mm. story all together. And oftentimes we think of stories in separate buckets, but that mm. isn't the way the world works. And the rage on the street is tied up so much with everything that's going on. So that's, that's sort of one. I, I think you're, you're, you're right that um, all of this, let me give you one other aspect of that's going on in the world that is part of this. We are an extremely divided United States of America. Um, politically, we see the world um, based on where you are in the political spectrum very differently. We don't even agree on basic facts in this country. And I think that that same thing can be said across the world. So you, here you have a story that at its core, the coronavirus story, is about science and facts, yet you don't have an agreement on that. And you have, and the media has been pulled into one camp and the media is disparaged by the president as fake and the and everybody is looking at every tweet for a possible sense that it is betraying some underlying bias and sometimes it is just a poorly written tweet by someone who wrote a bad tweet and there is no deep sinister message behind it other than someone wrote a tweet and tweets aren't edited as carefully as other things. So, but all of this is tied together. Um, and here we are, um, journalists, trying to navigate all of this. And all I can say is it's not easy. Um, and there are no rules. I can provide no, um, you know, sound bite that is going to make it easier. But we're all um, we're all sort of covering the news and looking around at all of the all of the um, the reactions, the way what we're reporting is being interpreted in the world at the same time. And it's just tough, tough. It's a tough time to be a journalist. You're scrutinized. It's really tough. But it's also I like to focus on the other part of it. It is like we are needed. Uh, more now than ever. And in the United States, a number of news organizations have, have uh, gone out of business during all of this. The ad market is collapsing. We haven't mentioned that. So anybody who's in this chat who has a job should be feel like, like it's a blessing, should feel lucky. There are a lot of journalists who are out of work. So it's like all of that together, we are needed more than ever and we need to um, emerge from this story with our reputations intact. And we have to work double time to not, um, to, to not do stupid things that, um, that hurt our, our reputation even more. So, so, so it's, it's like a real moment of truth, I would argue, for the media. And not do stupid things is the not do stupid bite. things exactly is, is exactly is exactly right. I just wanted to very quickly because I know we 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 promised to to, to let you let you you guys get. Um, I was going to say lunch, but in in probably Robin's case, uh, not lunch. And uh, man, it's it's almost one o'clock <laughs> from Robin and I. <laughs> so so uh, one thing I one one thing I wanted to uh, there's a question um, from Steph from South Africa. Thanks, uh, Steph. Just saying that we're a really small newsroom in a regional news newspaper and we absolutely can't do everything well what should we be focusing on most so perhaps you know Mar Marta uh, coming to you first and then uh, Robin and Mark uh, sorry could you please uh, repeat 
Sorry, yes. Um, this is a question from somebody who works at a very small newspaper in South Africa okay. and says, mm -hmm. I could, if we can't do everything, what, what should our newsroom focus on? What is the one thing that we should do really well? Yeah, I think uh, service is the main thing, is the main thing, uh, especially in uh, countries in development like Brazil, uh, we have to save lives. So our mission is to help people to survive uh, in both ways, in terms of health and, and in ter terms of economy, how to be uh, how to uh, go out from this crisis uh, with a small uh, business and everything, help people to deal with the problems uh, right now. If I have to choose just one thing, I would do this, this uh, uh, thing in terms of uh, service. Great. Mark, what's your advice? I, I, I think that that's really so smart. I, I guess one thing is you should be focusing on one thing and you shouldn't be trying to do everything and you shouldn't sort of say the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or anybody else is doing all these things and I should try to sort of do as many as I can. It's like really what is the, what is the essential need that you can fill in South Africa what, what's most needed by your readers. And that's essentially what Marta is saying, service. What do people need and then provide it? And, and, and forget about all the other things that a, a news organization can do. Do that really, really well. Robin. Um, cool. I, I, if I can, I just wanted to go quickly back to uh, what you were saying a uh, couple minutes earlier, Emily, about what Cuomo uh, raised, uh, which is uh, I have a slightly different perspective on that because um, I'm from Hong Kong and my parents are from Hong Kong and I'm sitting here in London and, you know, Italy happened uh, before, you know, the virus moved on to the state. So I was, you know, I was reading stories about Wuhan in both the Journal and the New York Times uh, at the end of last year, uh, story is about sort of how the virus was spreading throughout Asia and then into Italy, great stories about Bergamo uh, early in the year. So I kind of disagree a little bit about sort of the premise that there wasn't enough sort of reporting on um, the fact that this was coming, um, whether it's actually for the UK uh, or for the US. Um, but going back to, I mean, I don't have a whole lot to add to that question about the small newsroom and what you should do beyond what Marta and Mark said. Uh, absolutely agree with uh, what both of them have raised. Uh, and uh, just to sort of add a little bit to that is uh, start by listening. Um, I think if you start from there, uh, you can't really go wrong. I, th I think that's I think that's something that's come up from from everybody here. Um, I've been obsessed uh, in that slightly sort of self-absorbed way about how people have been talking in the last couple of years about real innovation in newsrooms, and they've been mentioning letters and newsletters and podcasting, which we were doing in two thousand and five. Um, and actually, I've begun to think well. Often there are things which are not necessarily innovations, but which perhaps we have forgotten about. And I think uh, I wouldn't call it crowdsourcing or UGC, but I think that the, the work that lots of people did over the past decades in, you know, and perhaps abandoned a little bit about actually connecting on a personal level on their own platforms with their audiences is, is definitely something that I'm seeing much more of in, 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 in journalism at the moment, which is absolutely goes to the, the heart of what all of you have been saying, which is listen, connect with your audiences, give them access points to what you do, let them kind of suggest things to you um, and, and hear from them. So that's, um, I think that, that that's great. Uh, Can I answer you, that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Emily, I mean, I think um, that this really resonates with me. I, I've, I spent uh, um, 18 months or two years uh, researching journalism innovation and wrote a report called, is it, you know, is it time to abandon the shiny things or step away from the shiny things when it comes to innovation. Uh, this was for the Reuters Institute. And I think um, a lot of what particularly Marta and now um, Robin and Mark have said about pulling back to, to core mission-based um, innovations is especially important in a local context. But also, I mean, I started my career as a journalist in local public broadcasting. And you don't get closer to your audience than you do within a, within a public broadcasting um, environment. So there's lots that we can take away from those uh, experiences. And in some ways, local news organisations have an advantage because they are traditionally physically closer 
to their organisation. So just some encouragement there for uh, many people uh, in the in our in our community right now who are from small uh, local or regional outlets. Um, and I think on that note, Emily, we might um, wind it up because yep. you guys have yep. enormous uh, tasks ahead of you in terms of reporting. Certainly in uh, in the US, the day is uh, not even half over. Um, and we, we certainly do want to thank you very much, um, uh, Marta and Mark. Uh, and uh, also, um, sorry, I'm having, Robin, a mental blank on your name. I'm looking at you <laughs> and I was about to call you something completely different, which would have been really, really unfortunate. <laughs> No, so, I also, Robin, I, Mark and Marta. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm also kind of going to um, uh, su suggest that though, uh, people can always um, commit to things which are months and months away, but I would love to revisit some of these conversations yes, with you absolutely. guys. Um, because one of the things we're going to do with our research is, is, is find out how frontline journalists are experiencing the issues that you're mm -hmm. talking about, but also how it changes over the course of the next year as we see all sorts of kind of economic pressures, but also um, hopefully things that we take away from this pandemic changing what we do in the, the, the newsroom for good, um, exactly. as well as as well as the, the downside. But I just want to thank all of you. That was an absolutely terrific conversation. I, I, co I copied Mark on when he said I could talk about this all afternoon. I, I really could. But I'm <laughs> not going to keep you from your lunch. So well, thank you very to. much. Yes, thank yeah. you very much, everyone. Thanks very much. Um, anyone who wants to take the survey who hasn't, we've had, um, I think I'm technically correct in saying thousands of responses now. Yes, um, but yeah. if you haven't taken the survey, please do. There is a link to it in the chat. Um, it's there so that we can capture uh, losses in newsrooms, but also experiences of journalists and your thoughts as well so uh it's yeah. it's really important that we capture this moment for the field uh and and learn how we can um uh, rebuild as they say better so and thanks very much indeed everyone just thanks. before you say goodbye though okay. just yes. <laughs> just before okay. you do that one important thing uh so this survey is currently in english this is a, a global survey uh from the journalism and the pandemic project the link as emily says is in the, the chat for the English version. Um, Marta, very relevant to your community. Uh, today we launched the Portuguese um, version of this survey. We have the survey coming out during the course of the week, also in French and Spanish and Russian, uh, and I'm going to forget a language, and Arabic and Chinese uh, in Mandarin. Mandarin. So um, please uh, share it within your, your communities, um, guys. And uh, we have another Journalism and the Pandemic uh, webinar next week focused on media freedom and journalism safety threats, which also came up during this conversation. Uh, we will be speaking to Courtney Radge from CPJ, Zoe Titus from the Namibia Media Trust, and uh, Mexican journalism safety expert, Javier Garza. So um, I'd very much uh, invite you to come back next Tuesday uh, at 1100 uh, Eastern for that conversation. And I must tell you that if you are not already in the ICFJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum, which now has over three and a half thousand members, which is a great core of our, of our study as well, that community, please join. Um, we're seeing a lot of wonderful collaboration happening there. And um, that's, that's an opportunity, whether you're from small town South Africa or from the New York Times, for you to connect um, and share your experiences. So thank, thank you once again. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. We are at the end of From Chotari podcast. Myself, Deepa Adhikari, signing out from today's episode. As always, we expect your critical and constructive comments on our podcast issues. Thank you for listening us. Namaste. Namaste.